everybody. Welcome to Podcast Before Me, the podcast about film, culture, politics, and Clint Eastwood, where we watch every film directed by and or starring American filmmaker Clint Eastwood and explore how they speak to their moment. And this one uh, shows hosted by two guys. I'm one of the guys. My name is Jake Serwin. I'm one of the guys. My name is Ian Ryan. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. It's been like six hours since I talked. Yep. To you. But I feel, I feel good. I think we got a good podcast energy today. The sun is not We've shining We've been podcasting here. so much. Yeah. Yeah. How about... Or is it raining down Nope. There? Just a beautiful haze. You're just indoors. Yeah. <laughs> that's oh, why, yeah, that's why the sun's not shining. Yeah. Uh, let's bring our guest yeah, in. I'm excited it. to do something. I want to... I feel like Jay Leno, because I'm going to hold the book up and like tap it on the desk. Uh-huh. Uh, our guest today is a podcaster, comedian, journalist author of the new york times best-selling book that's real raw dog the naked truth about hot dogs also someone with whom we have a beloved mutual friend jamie loftus welcome to the show hi how are you welcome doing great so nice to have you here normal Mm -hmm. oh feeling extremely normal over here as well (laughs) sitting on the floor really thriving I, i don't mean to blow up your spot you have a very elevated globe behind you can i say that you have yeah, a globe yeah that's my um that's my ex boyfriend's globe i just feel like it's nice to have a globe in the house oh but sure it's, i'm not locating anything you know yeah. at any time it, it it does i i'm realizing yeah cuz i just moved that it's the only thing in frame except me so it looks more <laughs> intentional mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's up so high and it it's is. like well, no, it's it. That's an illusion. I'm down so low because uh-huh. oh. uh, I'm sitting on the floor. So the globe is at a normal height. <sighs> the the arm for a globe is usually like half of that height. Ian, am I crazy here? No, you are crazy. Her globe seems normal. Okay. And I would like to know: Can you date it based on which countries have which names? What are we looking at here? <laughs> oh, um, that's an ASMR. Where do you want me to? Where do you want me to look? Let's check out a check. Czech Republic, Slovakia situation. Oh, okay. And you go okay, first. Okay. This is like, this is great. I was hoping there would be a geography test at the beginning <laughs> of the show. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, there will be. There's, what do we got? Uh, oh, yeah. We've got Union of Soviet Beautiful. Socialist Republics oh, here. Yeah. Prime time. Hell yeah. yeah. Shout out. Yeah. Let's hold on. A real moment in time. <laughs> cool. Cool, cool, cool. Soviet Soviet right. Republic. Perfect yeah. opportunity to get this out of the frame. Mm, really beautiful. good. We can focus. Yeah. Uh, love to do it. By the way, somewhat recently, star of the film we're talking about today, Sean Penn, appeared on the Conan O'Brien podcast. Yeah. On which Conan called cancel culture very Soviet. <laughs> Now, did he, did he mean this in a good Great. way? We can't know. We don't know. And also, given his date of birth and place of origin, yeah. even less clear. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, he's from kind of from down the street from where you are. Not really the yeah. street, but, you know. Anyway, the reason we got you on the show, Jamie, is uh, mm-hmm. for all, all sorts of reasons. But <laughs> one of the main ones is you're a Massachusetts... What I'm you ma- s- yeah, I'm a massive. You are, a yeah. Yeah. Calm. yeah. The I'm word I was trying Mass. to avoid saying. Um, yeah, What? so I looked it up. Brockton, not uh-huh. on the Mystic River. No, 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 we're close. But what is your experience with the Mystic River? I don't know. I mean, I'm like, I, I know I've been adjacent to it, but this is so like, this is my thing with movies about Boston is that they all either take place at Harvard or in this like five block radius of Southie, <laughs> which is like not reflective of their, <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's such a small portion, but it feels like every popular movie that takes place in Boston, like whether it's The Departed, whether it's The Town, whether it's Goodwill Hunting, which kind of straddles both, mm-hmm. like, mystic river it's all like guys stomping around being like my daughter and like in the same five blocks <laughs> right yeah so i have like i have no i i didn't grow up anywhere near southie i did you know i had friends who lived there or like i would go to bars there i got in trouble um when i worked for the boston globe i, I wrote a piece of, uh because i spent all day at a bar in southie on saint patrick's day and wrote about what i saw mm. and then i got denounced 
by uh, Representative Stephen Lynch for smearing the area. Um, but I wasn't, you know, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I have no experience in, in Mystic River. Don't know anyone who's been dumped there. Okay. Don't know anyone who's been executed there, anything like that. Not really reflective of what uh, Boston is like. Although I guess you get spot, a spotlight doesn't take place in either of those areas, but it does have the very common Boston theme of uh, brutal abuse of a child. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, I just wish there was a wider diversity but, yeah. of stories, locations, people, themes that take. There's Ted also. Mm-hmm. also yeah, there's, there's Ted. Ted. I was going to ask that. What about Fever Pitch? Fever Pitch. My grandma saw that in in theaters uh, <laughs> five times. She <laughs> really liked that movie. Yeah. Oh man. Cool. I mean, we'll get into the whole the whole Boston subgenre and specifically like Boston misery subgenre. I do want to ask. Mm-hmm. In your experience growing up in the Boston area, did you ever figure out where all the guys in these movies get that very special cut of leather jacket that is, appears to exist only in Boston movies? It's very <laughs> wide and very short. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like Robert I Wahlberg do know what you're wears one about. of them? Yeah. I do know what you're talking about. And also, again, I just can't, I can't answer for it. Okay. It's not, <laughs> it's not a Massachusetts that I personally know. I mean, and I also feel like it's weirdly pulled from like, the past Mm -hmm. also Mm -hmm. like i'm pretty sure that and and you know other boston residents can feel free to correct me on this point i've never lived in that area but it just feels like they're all wearing like clothes from the 80s in movies Mm -hmm. that are taking place in the 2000s but there's just such a huge i don't know and it's also it's based on a dennis lehane novel and he's just you know like Whatever, jerking off on a keyboard. I mean, he's a great writer, but what like, is uh-huh. going on is he with normal? him? Though? Is he, a he normal seems guy? like something. Unlikely. Well, something so bad oh, seems well, to have happened to him. Of, you know, we don't all know Dennis Lehane. That's another oh, thing okay. about the Boston okay. area. Oh. We don't all know him. <laughs> um, I don't know him. I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know his dad. I, you don't have an opinion about his dad. No, we don't know. We don't all know each other's parents. Uh, we don't. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Dennis Lehane. You know, I, I I hope he's well. It's weird. I feel like he's kind of like well, less so, but like you know what Stephen King is to Maine, Lehane kind of is to Boston. Right. Yeah, yeah, where yeah, yeah. He just kind of is. He just like won't shut up about it, and everyone's like, yeah, I guess it's like not good, but like, is it? You know, and um, I don't know. I was I lived in Maine for a while this summer, and I found. In the, in the writing community in Portland, Maine, a lot of animosity towards Stephen King. Their opinion on him, enough. You'll, you'll find some of that here on the pod as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lahane, of course, focused seemingly, like you said, on very specific parts of Boston, which I, get, I did some cursory research, grew up in like a working class family, you know, five kids yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he grew up in Dorchester. So, so part like, of his experience, real, yeah. I understand why Lahane writes about what he writes about. I just don't understand why it's like so hard to uh, get people interested in anything, but not to say they're not fascinating areas. They are, but yeah, Southie and Dorchester, there's, uh, there's a whole world out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a theory about this because I feel like Uh we're, we're sort of doing things a little out of order today, which is fine. There's a, I think this movie, maybe first Goodwill Hunting, and then this movie, like four years later, unlock mm-hmm. a new way for white actors to get to basically do minstrelsy because they get to do Boston mm-hmm. face and Boston voice. And I think this is like, people are excited to do this. It also, Boston, I think maybe because of you know, friend of the pod, socioeconomic forces are doing it. it, it, There's like, it it retains this kind of English style, strong class rigidity over generations that other cities in the US don't have. So you get to like, like, for example, Gone Baby Gone, another Dennis Lehane adaptation. Mm -hmm. The, the, The Casey Affleck character in that movie, like functions a lot like Shaft, where he is the guy who the people that don't want to talk to the police talk to him. But in this case, it's just very poor white people who will talk to him, but not talk to the police. So like, to me, this is my theory that I haven't really looked into at all. But like, the proliferation of these Boston misery crime movies, I think maybe stems from like, it's basically like, like Italians, 
the Bostonians are one of the last people that we can all make fun of safely without getting Soviet canceled, you know? Well, I don't know, guys. Uh, watch your fucking mouth uh, when you talk about the <laughs> You got to be pretty careful. I don't know. Yeah, is it is it the last place? There, no, I, I, that, that's an interesting theory. I, I haven't really thought a lot about it. I, I sort of, I, I feel like just because I grew up in that area, I also kind of attribute it to this like increased interest in the area and like the Boston mob specifically because of how Whitey Bulger kind of, you know, was yeah. in, amongst others, but was like so uh, prolifically evil um, in the, you know, like couple decades leading up to sort of this weird renaissance of Boston crime movies that went yeah. on for about yeah. 10 years. I do feel like there is like some cast off just from how the Boston mob briefly uh, was relevant and consistent news, which it isn't anymore. But but yeah, I mean, I, I think that those characters do kind of function in much the same way. And I do always think it's a treat when a prestige actor is like, I'm going to do the accent. I'm going because for it. Yeah. It's always like, it's always all over the place. Uh, the ones in this one, I, I will say, like, because I haven't seen this movie in a long time, but I was like, most of the accents are like pretty solid. I think and Kevin Bacon is like, yeah, he's a, he's, he's got it. I feel like he's yep. played guys from Boston since. Um, is he from big, Boston? Where is he from? I, I know he's from it. Philly. Oh, okay. Um, but they, well. but it's like an easy enough, you know, kind of migration in the accent. Yeah. And, and like, there are so many different kinds of, not that it matters. There, there's so many different kinds of accents within Boston too, where it's like, it, it definitely varies by class because then you have like the right. upper crust kind of kennedy style like equally thick but a different flavor of thick yeah kind of accent um whatever's going on with mike mitchell yeah mike uh -huh. mitchell jason Mazzucca's <laughs> hot dog <laughs> popcorn <laughs> it's just it's weird yeah do i have a mike mitchell specific question <laughs> well not not really specific to him okay. but i've been okay. watching a lot of these boston movies in the last week and no one else seems to say Quincy. They say Quincy, like a normal person would. Is it only the people from Quincy say Quincy and everyone else like in Boston says Quincy? No, I think most people say Quincy. Like they're, okay, my, so, my dad worked at a newspaper in Quincy for my whole life. So and, maybe it's all yeah. these these Hollywood yes, phonies yeah, pretending like to be from Boston. Yeah, the, all these these sick fucking diction freaks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> disparaging well let's let's get uh let's get back on on our podcast track really quick we got to do our stupid thing we always do uh our of Perfect. course our signature segment the two questions mm -hmm. jamie were you able to prepare a question or two for us yeah uh so i was i've obviously had clint on the brain same for for the last stretch and i was um i was watching an old episode of um siskel and ebert okay last week as i want to do and there was it was from the period of time where bridges of madison county was coming out mm -hmm. and it was a commercial for a fragrance called bridges Whoa. for bridges of madison county Whoa. and it was like living the dream forever like it was so clunky and like having seen the movie felt like not thematically appropriate but um, what if it smelled incredibly good for like 15 minutes before you could have time to enjoy <laughs> it i would like yeah, that a lot good that's good i was gonna say it smells like meryl streep's ashes but anyway <laughs> so my question is if there was a uh, if there was a fragrance for mystic river mm. what would you call it that's one of my questions and do you have any do you have any ideas well one of the things i discovered in my um investigations was of course that in a classic case of white colonizers being stupid uh they took the name for mystic river mm. from the local indigenous phrase which just meant large estuary of course so they were just describing it like scientifically <laughs> right. and they said like oh it was like miss it to yeah exactly i think is mm. yeah the phrase um yeah. so i guess i would try to get the smell of like a nice crossover freshwater saltwater seabird mm -hmm. in there or something you know ian loves the smell mm -hmm. brackish yeah exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> It's his signature scent. I like that. I like that very much. I am, of course, going to have to go with... So, my, my girlfriend is a big fragrance nut. This is her... My my hobby is uh, this podcast and hers is fragrance. Perfect. Yeah, it's so much cooler than me. But 
the the there's the we, the website Fragrantica, which is sort of like a letterboxed for for the most perfume. deranged people really? on earth. Yeah, it is so good. It is such a crazy because people who get into f- really? fragrance very quickly, like the you you go from basically you go from like weed to like double crocodile <laughs> immediately. <laughs> like your tolerance, your tolerance is so. Uh, low or high, I guess. Yeah. Whatever. People go nuts, and they'll they'll be commenting wow. on like a a perfume saying like, I was reading a lot of reviews saying that this had strong animalic like pissy notes, yes. but it wasn't Loved pissy it. enough for yeah, me. Exactly. People yeah. literally, they're like, I want this to smell more like piss. Another woman described one. They go so purple and so crazy in their descriptions of these smells and this woman was saying this reminded her of a night when a french man <laughs> scented her with his no. body <laughs> yeah so anyway wait, a, fr- this- wait, a french man scented her yeah i believe she with specifically his- said she- he scented her pubic hair mm-hmm. like i'm trying to understand what that could mean i mean like he like sp- Sprayed like a skunk, or he yeah, had like a, a cat or, or a skunk. No, <laughs> uh-huh. I think she meant like he just had a French his like yeah, musk fair, yeah, exactly. spray. Yep. Okay, yep, yeah. Okay, okay. A certain okay. this is where you learn. I'm, I'm like there. I don't know. All right, good for her. You got to get into it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, all this to say, I would. I think the Mystic River scent would be that of blood from a vampire's fang. <laughs> I'm thinking mm-hmm. a sort of a bloody slightly Mm -hmm. spitty and and uh (laughs) cold undead and very sad uh, no as we've discovered yeah Mm -hmm. exactly did you have did you have uh, any ideas for this jamie yeah i would call it my daughter (laughs) (laughs) yeah the daughter obsessed yeah it is the f- uh, yeah. I mean, and that's not to like uh (laughs) make fun of women being murdered, but the uh just it's like the easiest way to get into the Boston accent, I think. Yeah. Out of it. Like if I ever have to get into it for whatever reason, it's like mm. my God. Like it's just so he says it so many times, <laughs> and he says it correctly, but it's just it gets yeah. to be so. Boy, does this guy love his daughter? He loves her so much. He loves her so fucking much. Did you have a Boston accent, or have you always been kind of? Oh yeah. TV pilled. Okay, so you've no. It was gone. Like. By the time I was in like late high school, yeah, because I was like, you watch enough TV. And then I also, my mom has such a thick accent that when I was a kid, I was like embarrassed about it. I didn't think I had an accent, but I like digitized all of my home videos uh, in the last couple of years. And it's like, Mm. it's brutal. And when it's kids, it's pretty fun because you're just like, why does this kid sound like she just smoked a pack of cigarettes, (laughs) you know? (laughs) uh yeah i i had a speech impediment so i have i sort of had an accent but it was like a child accent i specifically sounded like i was from child you know you do you ever do you have like a is there a menloism that you or bay area did you ever say hella oh uh, yeah on Which i was about to say what we have is the classic not totally white but mostly white upper middle class to upper class stealing black vernacular that we thought was cool so hell is a good example specifically from e40 and yeah. andre nicotina yep. exactly yeah. correct yeah did you ever get hyphy oh yeah oh yeah baby did you get stupid dumb and hyphy? oh yeah All my right. bitter beer That's face good. was wow. famous <laughs> <laughs> no. you ever had e40's wine either no. of you no uh I forgot what it's called. E40 has a signature wine. We'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> Will we? <laughs> It'll come up. Thank you for the question. I, I have a question for both of you, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. This is related to your book, Jamie, which I have enjoyed very thoroughly. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I was thinking I was about the origin of the, the wiener. You go into the, the long sure. sort of genealogy of the hot dog. And I realized that I have, like, without really thinking about it, always used the spelling... Wiener, W-I-E-N-E-R for the hot dog because they are from yeah. Wien. They're, they're Vienna, they're Viennese style sausages. But when uh-huh. referring either to the euphemistic, the, the famous penis, uh, which we <laughs> love to talk about on the show, or calling somebody uh-huh. a wiener like they're being a coward or whatever, I E-I, say W-E-I. Right? Yeah. Is that... What is... I, I don't... I. Again, you're asking a series of very challenging questions. I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't know. No, I I don't know. I wish I knew. But do I, you I, do that I, too? I would have do to you imagine guys... it has something to do with the 
German, the language of German. Mm, I guess yes. so. Uh, yes. Yeah. I spell but, it like the, I maybe know. I'm thinking of the Mad Men guy who's famously uh, <laughs> poorly it's behaved. True. Ian, do you mm. know what I'm talking about? Is this r- behavior relatable to you? No, I don't know what you're talking about at all. You're not writing down the word wiener all the I, time? No, I I mean, if you're asking me whether it's, you know, uh, I've ever lost a grasp of the English language. I think if anybody's ever heard another episode of this podcast, I don't think there's that yeah. much question about Ian, that. Ian moved to Mexico and is I, I recently called him semi-lingual because yeah, I think he's got like half of each. Although I would like to point, point out that he once tried to pick an example of me picking like a, a homophone and he picked the wrong one. So I was saying like plane of what existence and you said, well, actually that should be P-L-A-I-N. And I said, no, it shouldn't. Uh, oh, so. no, because it's because I was looking at your existence, bitch. Uh-huh. Plain, plain bitch. Um, sorry, yeah. I said bitch. We talked about this on the show recently. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for the, that was the two questions. We're done. Mm-hmm. Uh, so today we're talking about <laughs> Mystic River, which is uh, a film directed by Clint Eastwood. Have you ever heard of him? This was released on October 15th, 2003. Same day as Runaway Jury and Pieces of April. We all remember this this big weekend. And also, incidentally, a week before, Jane Campion's In the Cut, Mm. which has a very good, very scary Kevin Bacon performance uh, as Mm -hmm. like an unstable veterinarian, I believe. Huge month for Kev. Huge, huge month for Kev. He's having a real normal one. And the next year, of course, (laughs) he is in that very strange film, The Woodsman in which he plays a child molester who is released from prison and tries to stop being a child molester, which uh, I remember him directing it, which I was wrong about that, but it just seemed like, why do you want, like, this is your Oscar play, Kev? It's like, I don't know. What I'll say about Kev is he takes big swings. Yeah, he the sure man, does. The man swings. And the Oscars yeah. were rewarding big swings based on what gets nominated here. I'm, I'm going to just spoil a little bit. Yeah. I enjoyed the film somewhat, but it's boy does it just go for the fences sometimes in a way that feels a little bit embarrassing. It is, yeah. it's yeah. The, but they people liked it. They ate it up seemingly. This was two thousand three. I think this is people who don't like Clint Eastwood's favorite Clint Eastwood movie. A lot of the times, this is uh, this is uh, an observation for no one. I feel like this is the Bruce Springsteen's "I'm on Fire" of Clint Eastwood movies because people who, <laughs> whenever there's a Bruce Springsteen cover album. The person who seems like the the most sure I'll do that and the least actual Springsteen fan covers I'm on fire. It's always like mm. like Sarah Bareilles did it once or like Vampire Weekend did it anyway. Um, mm. You guys know what I'm talking about. They're both nodding so much for the listener. They're <laughs> nodding. They're probably going to hurt their necks. If you want to watch the film here in the United States, we encourage you to do so. Uh, you can do it on all the usual places. Ian, if someone's down there in Mexico and they want to watch Mystic River... Uh, where can they find this bad boy? Well, it is available streaming for free if you have a subscription to the Cursed Max. Uh, it's also available on Amazon, Microsoft, Google Play, Claro Video, and Apple TV. Now, Jamie, for your information, uh, I used to do a bit on the show where I would say that in Mexico, Apple TV was called Manzana TV because they speak Spanish there. Mm-hmm. I stopped doing it's that. We now do a different bit where an AI-generated voice says that for me and then <laughs> ian and our guests have to guess who the very badly approximated ai voice is supposed to be so uh here we go right. manzana tv manzana tv wait and what am i guessing who who that, is this supposed that to computer be? is trying manzana to be TV. this is supposed to be someone very famous and i should say <laughs> related to the film okay okay in the film in this case, I'll give I'll yeah, give that tough. to you. Yes. All right. Okay. Manzana TV. In the film, though. Yeah, and is this Manzana TV? What if I told you that this guy it... has a crazy name in the movie? Manzana TV. Is it? Is this supposed to be Lawrence Fishburne? It's Morpheus. Manzana TV. Isn't that huh. terrible? <laughs> if he was from like the Midwest or something, <sighs> that's really cool. Yeah, that sounds really that weird. Is... That is the first thing I, I I wanted to talk about when I was because I yeah. yeah I haven't seen this movie in easily like ten years or something, and the one black character is named Detective Sergeant Whitey Powers, yeah. which is yeah. the most unhinged thing I've ever 
hurt. It's, and and, the, it's and it's so scenes, crazy. And they're compulsively introducing I know. him. I was certain. Every scene they were going to make a joke about it's it. Insane. They're going to address it. It's going to come yeah. up sometime. They never do, which I actually like and much also, more. No. It's like a mythos. Like a famous <laughs> Boston thing. People love to talk about how Boston is a site of a lot of racial uh-huh. conflict. Sure. Jack Nicholson's first yeah. first line in The Departed, he he says like 11 words in that movie before the famous N word. That's like the 12th word in the whole movie. Like it's it's a part of Boston's <laughs> heritage, you know? Well, it's, like a very, it's very much a part of like both like the city's history, obviously, and also just like the stereotypes you see repeated in these movies too yeah which is i don't know i I feel a lot of ways about that too because massachusetts is a far more diverse state than uh, anyone talks about and it just (laughs) makes it seem like it's a city uh full of white people screaming Mm -hmm. at uh people of color who don't appear to be there (laughs) um so but it is like i don't know there's a lot but but because it is like such a common stereotype and reality in Boston. The fact that they <laughs> he, they introduce him by his full name in every single yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah. And it's there's no indication that his real name is like, you know, uh Martin Powers or whatever. Like there's no, no. suggestion that Whitey is a, a nickname of any kind. Apparently Clint uh yeah. originally wanted Forrest Whitaker to play this role. Forrest Whitaker, of course, who was the star of Bird, his Charlie Parker biopic. Of course. I liked Lawrence Fishburne. I think he did a wonderful Me job. Me too. Oh, I'm he's always happy to see him. Yep. Big Larry. His first appearance, he's got like little 2003 sunglasses on. <laughs> Obviously, does. part of his movie star persona is that he wears little sunglasses really well, but like mm-hmm. he does it well here. He'll also come he back does, in the he's mule. He's got the accent. Larry's got the mm-hmm. accent down pat. Yeah, yeah he does. And he's basically like in a number of the reviews I was reading, people compared this character to Dirty Harry because he's like the cool detective who is, you know, above it all and sort of calm and collected and also goes a little outside of the law. In- yeah, he steals the car so he can get a yeah. illegal search. This is Dirty Harry stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, Jamie, what is your Clint Eastwood history? What's your what? How do you feel about the man? Have you watched a lot of the films? Where are you on Clint? Where am I on Clint? I gotta be honest. I'm pretty Clint agnostic. I don't have strong feelings about his body of work. I've seen a lot of it because I, I mean, like, I, don't know, I think his politics are uh, pretty fucking abysmal and scary. Um, but the man does have range. <laughs> I will, yep, I will grant yes, him. Yep. He's got range. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel, and, and I, I'm, I guess, curious why Clint Eastwood has appealed so strongly to you because i feel like in the last two years a lot of more people are asking how you feel about clint eastwood and i don't feel like i have a sufficiently strong opinion in any which way i didn't i don't know we didn't grow up like a fan of his work the last movie of his i saw that like really sucked his uh j edgar biopic oh i haven't seen it yet i haven't seen it looks like it's gonna be not there crazy of course we're not fans of j edgar to be clear yeah buckle in it fucking it fucking stinks man (laughs) it's not good um but i don't know it's got the the social networks uh uh, army hammer that's another sort of in the boston (laughs) movie universe a man only famous for one thing having been in the social network of course (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah he wishes <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know i i uh i think his politics suck i i find westerns boring and um and i've seen but and yet i've seen so much of his work <laughs> i mean i think you know i'll let you sort of wh- why do we All why right. do we do this podcast yeah i mean the, the, i'm always trying to answer this answer i think has probably evolved for me to be clear i'll just speak for myself not an out and out fan of either his politics or his movies like across the board i couldn't say that you know um we've talked before people often come on here and assume well the last is like well besides clint eastwood who's your favorite director who's your favorite actor and i i mm. for me he's not in the conversation for who my favorite director is necessarily <laughs> so uh it's not that uh, for me that's not the reason i think part of what inspired us to do this is that he is such an incoherent i think is a word we use a lot man in terms of his politics Mm -hmm. like on film so in films we've looked at you know he Mm -hmm. has extremely not just progressive in the sense of uh like virtue signaling or something but really human empathizing 
nuanced looks at like sex work at uh the misdeeds of the police and he's also the guy who made dirty harry he's also the guy who uh you know has supported uh people like mitt romney in a republican convention who will say shitty things like uh what was his little quote about the death penalty saying like you know there's some guys i wish i could you know really just like rub them out or whatever some some nasty thing about wanting to uh be killing people and also he said that in the context Mm -hmm. of being asked about his film uh true crime which is a film that pretty comprehensively makes the death penalty seem like a bad idea so again i think that's what attracted us to him like this guy why would he make a movie that is, uh, you know, interested in not just like the death penalty is bad, but what does that mean for the warden? What does that mean for the priest in the prison? And and also he comes out and is like a bold, brash, ridiculous guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I think for me, it's not I don't know if it's incoherence as much as it's like explicit contradiction mm. between what he's saying and what his movies are saying, which I find is very interesting and also jamie as you mentioned i think in the last couple of years there's been a broader like sort of reappraisal of clint eastwood as director specifically on these grounds that like his movies are addressing parts of american culture that ostensibly directors to the left of him which of which there are there are plenty ostensibly they're not touching like they're they're making movies that don't relate as much to what people are sort of feeling innately mm-hmm. in American culture at the moment. And also to speak to another thing that you said, like most of these movies are just very watchable. So we're having yeah. a grand old time. It's not not too hard to go through, you know, that's what's fascinating. I have a, a dear friend of mine who's a YouTuber, uh, Maggie Mae Fish, made a video about his work a couple of months ago. And so I was hearing a lot about him and and the all over the placeness that you're describing and like it's i don't know i mean i do think it's interesting that he's like covered such a wide like it seems like he's really surfed through genres mm-hmm. over the years Certainly. and you can just you can kind of tell when uh, clint has developed a new uh interest yep. yeah <laughs> which is kind yeah. of like it was just definitely interesting i don't know i i i'm looking at his um and and also that there doesn't seem to be and I mean you guys know far better than me but based like based on what I'm like looking at it doesn't seem like there's a really a distinct house style where I've like seen movies of his and had no idea he like I didn't know he directed Changeling mm-hmm. that yeah. movie is like not a distinct visual like you know I don't think I I, I don't always know when I'm watching a Clint Eastwood which is even movie. weirder because yeah. he has this team of people that are it's not just him right it's often like the same editor same cinematographer yeah he'll work with the same cinematographer yet, for like 18 right. movies in They're, a row it's yeah. unrecognizable sometimes incoherent does seem to be the vibe <laughs> like it's but I mean yeah I think yeah. that I, like my connection to this movie specifically was just that like every adult i knew <laughs> saw it yeah uh, because and I, I don't think i saw it till i was in college but yeah like every every adult i i knew saw it and it was one of the movies that you know like when i was growing up people would be like oh boss <laughs> is it like mystic river like, <laughs> yeah what could you yeah. possibly mean by that yeah i was recently uh, beaten and, and shot no. in the head yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah emmy rossum's constantly getting us uh-huh. shot in that also I forgot that Emmy Rossum plays the iconic role of my daughter <laughs> yeah. in this movie. Um, and Shout out to Emmy Rossum. Yeah. We share a birthday. Iconic, oh, she doesn't iconic know. Woman corpse. Yeah. yeah. Emmy yep. Rossum. She was 16 in this. She's playing I know, 19. In the she, next was year, 16. she was in Phantom of the Opera oh, with Gerard Butler, Gerard Butler oh, Jerry. playing Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And now that was a movie I was absolutely, uh, you know, seated for mm-hmm. many times mm-hmm. many many times she recently played angeline on that peacock show oh, about yeah, angeline good. yeah i didn't see it uh shout out um shout out emmy rossum shout out uh, barry white we also the three of us birthday Ooh. pals not gonna mention <laughs> really? any not gonna mention anybody wow. else uh the holy trifecta yeah well paul tompkins too oh. but oh, there's nice. some other guys i'm not gonna mention um because they're uh louis ck <laughs> so um <laughs> Anyway, Ian, had you seen this movie before? I had never seen this This was my first time. Yep. I recalled this film strongly only because I had fond memories. This was like the year 
that I discovered the movies uh, in the sense of like movies as an art form. I remember watching the Oscars with my mom very attentively because I had seen some of these films because they got critical recognition. Uh, it was very nice to share with an adult this like uh, sense of art as something beyond yourself, right? Not just as like this entertainment product that you consume. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking Cold Mountain, Mystic River. These are the films of our time. Now, I have not thought about these films since, basically. I don't think that they made that much of a cultural impression. Looking at what was at the Oscars this year, a lot of junk to me. And then some things that we still talk about a lot, uh, like Lost in Translation or whatever. Master and Commander. Yes. T film Twitter favorite. The worst Lord of the Rings movie. Yes, also <laughs> true. But no, I hadn't seen it. I have seen all the films that, Jamie, you mentioned earlier. The Town, Gone Baby Gone, The Departed, all these things that I certainly got my impression of. Not Boston as a whole. My dad is yeah. from Bedford, so I've been to Boston a few times in my life. Um, but I don't think I knew that. Yeah, there you go. We're still learning and growing together. Beautiful. <laughs> but I, I thought I knew what this film was like, and I feel like I kind of did in the end. A lot of it does sort of retread the same territory. Didn't feel like there was a ton of totally unique things. But then I think there's some stuff in here that's worth talking about. What was your experience with the yeah. film, Jake? I had never seen it before. I also, I was like a very, I was a real Oscars boy because my mom was very invested in the Oscars. Mm -hmm. And so we would watch it. And so, like, to me, I, I guess I believed that, for example, I think I believed that Billy Crystal was, like, everyone's favorite comedian, <laughs> and that's why he knows yep. it so much. Like, I they, also believed mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, I guess, well, I guess blackface is sometimes okay, because <laughs> yeah. Billy Crystal just does your it voice. so much. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, no, I think he did it. He did the makeup as oh, well. wow. Uh, but, At the um, Oscars? Yeah, pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll look it up. We'll post it. Uh, no, actually, we won't no, do we that. Will but, not. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I I thought of this as one of those fucking bummer movies of the time that I were for adults and were not interesting to me because they didn't have like elves or uh, spaceships or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I had recently seen Space Cowboys and enjoyed it, at least within the last couple of years prior to this. But I was like, this is not this is not for me at all. This is an acting movie and I'm not interested in those. Uh, and then watching it this time, I was surprised at just how unceasingly bleak it is. My girlfriend got up and was like pacing around the room because the movie was making her feel so bad and so angry, specifically the scene on the the beach, the banks of the mystic with... Sean Penn and, and Tim Robbins and then yeah. um, cutting back to the boys in the kitchen, which I think is the film's finest sequence by far, but also like really just kind of awful I to mean, sit through. Brutal, yeah. Yeah, this is one of the rare movies that I watched once for the podcast <laughs> last night. I was like, am I gonna go through it again? And then I decided actually the this movie is so, you know, affecting that I did last night, I uh, I think I became the first person in the history of mankind to watch Spotlight a second time. Yeah. I don't think anyone's done this before. I've seen Spotlight. <laughs> oh, you have? Left. A little bit okay. unfair, Jenny, because yeah. you, of course, were basically in Spotlight. You famously were fired from the Boston Globe, right? I, Your well, khakis I was weren't the, big enough. Mm -hmm. That's why they fired you. That's what I, I picked up from the, at the I was working at the Globe when that movie was in production, wow. too. So I was very... Oh, shit invested mm -hmm. in or everyone around me at least was very invested in like how that movie was going to come out yeah uh and it's i mean obviously a ton of thematic uh overlap yes. yeah yep. well and and that's the spotlight investigation is happening when this movie is being made the yeah. the the guy in the car at the beginning in the book doesn't have the bishop's ring but they gave it to him the character because of Oh, the, oh okay. the, that makes the, sense. the revelations from those spotlight stories. Mm -hmm. Since you touched on it very quickly, I will say that I lots of the parts of the movie I thought were very affecting, very effective. This is where Clint sometimes falls short when he's dealing with big emotional experiences. I don't know how I felt about the opening in terms of uh, representing trauma. I think later in the film... Uh, the Tim Robbins stuff does a much better job of of showing like somebody trying to work through or or not working through trauma. Uh, but what did you? I wanted to hear what you guys think. If I was just being cynical, 
there's like a little moment after he gets rescued and one of the dads says, oh, he's damaged goods now. And it, uh, I don't know. It felt like he was maybe trying to get his hands around something and then figured it out later how to, how to approach it from an angle he was more comfortable with. But what did you guys feel about this? I mean, I think the movie spells things out a little bit too much, like just jumping straight to the end of the movie, like the sort of the final thematic line where, you know, Sean Penn says, asks, or one of one of either Penn or Bacon says, like, when was the last time you saw Dave or whatever? And it was 20 years ago when he got in that, yeah. that car. Yeah. Right. And I, Clint has already cut to the shot of the kid in the car, which would have been like broad enough. But then to have somebody actually say it yeah. made me think. Well, and then and then for Kevin Bacon to take it a step further and be like, like uh, sometimes yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Let's exactly. get in that car. You've You're got like, that. Oh, oh. Yeah. It's like yeah. hat on hat on hat on. You literally have the like <laughs> unfinished name in the in the concrete. Uh-huh. And like even the yeah, choice, da, yeah. the crime being like yeah. a kidnapping <laughs> version of uh, child abuse, which is of course real and very upsetting. But I will say, uh, I think we probably all know, kind of like uh, rape, more common that it happens between people who know each other within families, within you know existing like a, a role somebody Catholic has. Church. Uh, yes. Well, sure. Yeah. It's like if they want to make the Catholic Church connection, then like yeah. actually do it. You know, I. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I felt like the the way that trauma was handled, I felt like it was more effective for me on like a performer to performer mm-hmm. level versus just like overall. I don't know. It just felt very, yeah, like the, the writing got pretty schlocky in some places. And it's just like either they weren't telling you enough uh-huh. or they were telling you the theme over and over and over, which I guess is right. a very Oscar Beatty thing to do. And this yeah. is a very Oscar Beatty movie. And then this goes back to more of like, Lahane stuff where I just always like get frustrated when it's like, all right, how do we get these, uh, this group of adult men to examine mm. the course of their lives? <laughs> We're going to have to kill a woman and then yes. never yeah, learn anything about her. And that has to be the inciting incident. Ooh, I'm the women just, in this like, film, confusing how they're oh, portrayed. <laughs> I mean, and, and I've never been less shocked that like this fucking murderer's row of, you know, like, uh, white guys could not, you know, get even close. They're like, don't even bother. Like, she's a beautiful girl she was great <laughs> she had friends yeah she like yeah. that and like yeah. that's as far as you fucking get she was young she we like it when women are young like it, that's one of the good things about her oh young murdered yeah. women yeah we, beautiful we love to and see it. uh unspoiled um, mm-hmm. potentially yeah i i mean the way that yeah women are written in this movie is uh pre- it's, which right. i know is like a separate thing because i think that like it's a worthy you know thing to try to examine this kind of trauma and how it affects groups of people like real like friendships and relationships between adult men. I feel like that's something that isn't like really done very Mm. frequently and then even less rarely well, but it was a boy like (laughs) watching the way that like the, just like women are uh, behaving in a vacuum in this, the I found the Laura Linney speech at the end. I was it's so scary. scary. Yeah, this yeah. Lady Macbeth turn. Where did this come from? We, she's spoken like ten right. words Bizarre. in the film. Yeah, exactly. Right, because we yeah. know nothing about this lady up until at the end, where she's yeah. like, "I don't care that you killed your you're friend, even though you're... you didn't do anything. You're a fucking king. I want to have sex with yeah. you and let's go to a parade." Yeah, like, who yeah. is this lady? Well, uh huh. How did he meet her? There. Uh, She's supposed to be Marsha Gay Harden's cousin, also. Sure, but it's like, yeah. why aren't there right. more scenes between them? Like, where, what is that yeah. relationship? But it doesn't, you know, that's not where the well, if, writer's if interest lies. somebody's like, gotten this far into the podcast without planning to watch the film, but somehow they still need to know the plot synopsis very quickly, we've talked around it a little bit. Uh, there's these three boys who are playing uh, hockey in the street, and uh, then a car pulls up, some guys pretending to be cops tell one of them or t- like they just pick one of them and say you got to get in the car he is uh, abducted and held in some kind of uh shed for four days where he is sexually abused he escapes 20 years later they're all still around the boston area one of them jimmy markham is sort of a small time hood who may or may not have gone straight uh, his daughter disappears she is found murdered in a park Dave, the Tim Robbins character who was the one who was kidnapped, he is uh, broken by the experience. He's a big sort of lumbering shell of a man uh, who comes home that same night 
uh, with blood on him mysteriously and tells a, a story that doesn't really hold water about having uh, shot a mugger or beat up, beaten up a mugger. And then investigating the whole thing is the Kevin Bacon character, uh, Sean Levine. Levine? Divine. Ah, uh, Divine. Whatever. Who we also, like, get... He, he gets... Oh, he God. also has yeah, a woman as so well that we weird. know nothing about. Where he's like, yeah. Lauren, Lauren, what's going on? Yeah. Like, what is and going on with Lauren? She, she's a prop. She's got and the we basically to say, like, look at how <laughs> yeah. emotionally unstable and and like undependable these yeah. these guys are, right? But yes, yeah, she, exactly. And then they try to make her into a thing at the end. Similarly, yeah. just very clumsy, right. very. And they're also she's she exists almost entirely in close ups of a mouth, mm-hmm. where you think at the end they're gonna at least reveal that it's like somebody famous, I guess. <laughs> That's her yeah. art. Is that and, it turns and also, out she has yeah. a face we don't recognize because like, it really seems like they're hiding that it's yeah uh, whatever. Like who who would be it? Like Bridget Fonda <laughs> mm-hmm. or something? But it they're not. It's just the lady. Like she's an actress. You know. Yeah. It's. I mean. It's like the the, the script doesn't ask much of her. Um, <laughs> she is mostly standing there. It's so yeah. It's just very. Uh, and then Marsha yeah. Gay Harden's character. Well, I'm well, sorry. But I'm, she, I'm I mean, yeah. So, so there are these, there are women on the periphery of this film. There, Laura Linney plays Sean Penn's wife, uh, who is the stepmother of the Emmy Rossum character, which is an interesting dynamic that isn't really explored. Um, her character's name is Annabeth Markham. And her cousin, Celeste mm-hmm played by Marsha Gay Harden, is married to Tim Robbins' character Dave. They also have a little son who is Michael. played by a kid named Caden Boyd. Good mm-hmm. name for a who kid. Who we all know as the normal boy from Shark Boy and Lava Girl, ah. uh, or The Adventures of Same. He's oh. the, the normal boy who they take on their whirlwind adventure mm. to wherever they go. Okay. <laughs> what a treat. And what a treat. Uh, then you've got, the, you got Emmy Rossum's boyfriend... Brendan Harris, played by a guy named Thomas Guiri, or Geary, Guiri. who was in The Sandlot. Guiri. Gu- Guiri. Mm-hmm. And he's also on The Black Donnellys, which will not come up again <laughs> on the episode in any way. Humiliating to Ian. Uh, and then Spencer Treat Clark, best known as uh, Maximus's dead son in Gladiator and Bruce Willis's alive son in Unbreakable. Uh, he is Brendan's mute brother silent ray harris so all of these people are sort of you know it's one of these the the these very it's a very book thing i feel like to have uh, a neighborhood of and everyone's interconnected and has all this family history lahane is an interesting guy this this movie comes at like a it's a transition point from clint's very popcorn 90s where he's adapting a lot of um airport novels of which this is one i think into his prestige 2000s he goes into kind of oscar mode where basically everything he does million dollar baby change right i was like that's yeah, yeah that's the, the, the I world war ii of, yeah. diptych of uh, flags of our fathers and letter from iwo jima mm-hmm. and gran torino and then uh but this is like in the middle where this is very much like a dennis lahane i feel like is a is a real mass market paperback kind of author but his books are always like and I, by his books, I mean the movies that are made from them because I don't know how to read. But the the they're like so dark. Like this is too much. If I'm on the beach, like this is this is too much. Gone Baby Gone is too much. Shutter Island is mm-hmm. a little too much. Dachau a little too much. Like my wife killed all our ch- like drowned all our children and doesn't realize it. Spoilers for that movie. Uh, uh, the drop. <laughs> I feel like is uh, that's a I love, fun love movie. The drop. Yeah. That that gets the tone of like uh, wacky sort of pulpy right, but this is like at this sort of fulcrum point between the kind of absolute power true crime Clint of the '90s and the these movies are serious and sad Clint of the 2000s. Yeah, I think on paper it's very interesting to say, all right, what does trauma look like? in an environment that is already conditioned to sort of accept suffering as a normal thing, right? So how does that play into the fabric of the community? How do these people relate to each other? Of course, the classics of like cops and criminals coming out of the same environments. But it's very Hong Kong uh in that way. It is very better tomorrow in that way. Yeah. Well, it's interesting then because The Departed is a 
it's is infernal a affairs transplantation uh-huh. of yeah hong kong to boston anyway but like i think you're saying it's it's taking that darkness it's trying to figure out how you turn that into like the oscar version and also the enjoyable just cop thriller mystery version and can you layer those simultaneously those three or four types of things which i think as an art strategy trying to take disparate elements and turn them into a single work sometimes very effective sometimes you create great stuff and then sometimes i think you create a hodgepodge of elements that don't really make sense together speaking of disparate elements and and hodgepodge i found a, a great article uh from the press tour for this movie where Clint is, this is from the New York Daily News, uh, October 5th, 2003. Uh, River of No Return, Clint Eastwood brooks no compromise on his darkest film yet. This is by a guy named Jack Matthews. It opens, uh, Clint Eastwood's favorite movie this year is the two-part sequel to The Matrix. Not that he thinks it's good or even claims to have seen it. He was out of the country when the first half, The Matrix Reloaded, opened in May and has forgotten its title. <laughs> unloaded whatever it is he said all i know is that it was the best friend we had when we were working on our movie because of course the attention on that movie kept the studio execs away from his set which he says allows this movie to be as bleak and miserable as it is Mm. and i do think there's it's interesting that you you mention this combination of all these different sort of what did you say art strategy some kind of (laughs) psycho shit that you can (laughs) might have said that uh, there's the scene the like is that my daughter in there scene with pen surrounded by all the cops is reminding me of the the scene in the matrix reloaded where neo is fighting all of the agent smiths and they all sort of like Mm -hmm. uh clobber onto him and then he explodes out of them and it's like there is a way that i wonder if this movie would be like a little better or easier to take somehow if it was like a little more operatic like a little further into the sort of like john woo tone of it all then it would seem more accessible that you have this tim robbins who's both like a mastermind in the box who flips it on these cops and we're sort of feeling like oh my god what is this uh that we're (laughs) unraveling and then he's also just a broken like manchester by the sea guy whose trauma basically defines his whole life and you're sort of like okay this is the same character you're telling me yeah i mean this movie really hangs the tim robbins character out to dry i think that tim robbins like gives an unbelievable performance in this movie i I agree i totally agree i think he and marcia gay harden both do incredibly and that marcia gay harden i like feel a bunch of ways about how her character is treated and discarded especially when laura (sighs) Linney at the end of the Mm -hmm. fucking movie is like geez how yeah. could she say that i was like yeah. your daughter yep. yeah. just died like wh- where are your priorities well, you're all over the place this this movie has we should say that uh sean penn wins best actor and tim robbins wins best supporting yeah. marcia uh-huh. Harden is is nominated but loses to renee zellweger for cold mountain huh. also patricia clarkson was nominated for pieces of april i don't think i knew that and Holly Hunter for 13. Oh, damn. Big year. But there's a reading of this movie, I guess, a, a sort of a generous one about everyone here being just crushed by patriarchy, men and women alike. Like, you can't go to therapy. You can't work your shit out if you're traumatized because right. it's not a manly thing to do. Sean Penn's character is trapped in this masculine like i must be the king of my family defend everybody pattern that keeps him like doing crime killing people that he's friends with and mm-hmm. laura linney and marcia gay harden are trapped by husbands they're terrified of until it turns out laura linney is secretly the mastermind <laughs> of it all yeah she's actually really into it and it's really Kevin Bacon is so ready to let Sean Penn uh, get yeah, away yeah. with <laughs> murder. To the, uh-huh. the, uh, the little yeah. pew pew at the Which end. Which sort like, of foreshadows uh-huh, the, the uh-huh, famous uh-huh. Gran Torino pew pew that Clint will do mm-hmm. later. Um, <laughs> do we like... Let's talk about Sean Penn. I... What a, talking about a man... Don't like Sean Penn. 
Yeah, I, yeah. Unpleasant to watch, but in real life, just also yeah. incomprehensible. This man's behavior. also obsessed with daughters. <laughs> yeah, one of the all-time worst. Anytime, any yeah, obsessed with daughters. His I, own, I, other yeah. people's. Yeah. Ever since I learned about his history, there. I mean, the way he like treated Madonna during their marriage. Yeah. I'm like I'm out. I'm out uh, well, for Sean Penn for life. He just seems like the most insecure kind of fucking person in the world. And also this is like such a weird era for him too. Cause he just did. <laughs> I am Sam. Yeah. Like he just so desperately wants a trophy that he'll do. He puts his big anti-Iraq ad out so during this period. Yeah. He's reminds yeah. me, unfortunately, well, he, has, he has an Oscar already for a movie that, that Tim Robbins directed. Hmm. Like he already has best supporting for dead man walking. Oh wait, no, that was just a nomination. Never mind. Okay. So yeah, he is insane. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, he was gonna keep doing this shit until yeah, they gave yeah. him the fucking trophy. So whatever they gave it to him, and uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Talking about uh, a guy so, who no, hasn't him. worked his shit out very clearly. Unfortunately, he's most reminiscent no. to me of uh, if you've ever been in like a socialist organization or any type of activist group where it turns out that somebody has um, like predatory tendencies or has like extremely aggressive behavior sometimes combined right. with you know on the on paper like liberatory politics right he's like famous for being a yeah. friend of hugo chavez and caring about haiti all of a sudden and all this stuff and he's a guy who seems to have abused many many people in his personal life and well, yeah and then there's there's the hilarious thing where like so he's he's been charged with uh beating up mostly journalists i think because they're the people that he beats up next to other people with cameras mm -hmm. uh but like there's, you know, five or six of these times that he's had some kind of legal repercussions for beating up journalists. And then in 2015, Lee Daniels is talking about Terrence Howard and how his career was almost derailed by domestic violence uh, allegations and saying, how come this didn't happen to Marlon Brando or Sean Penn? And there's a whole, he's bringing up a, a, like a, a very prurient point about the different treatment of black actors and white actors, but also domestic violence is bad no matter who does it. And then Sean Penn's whole uh, response to this is a, a $10 million defamation suit against Lee Daniels saying, I've never been arrested for or charged with domestic violence. <laughs> okay, great. I've only been beating people up in public. Yeah. Just um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Domestic violence is such a uh, such an easy thing right, to, to pursue. take yeah, legal action course. for. Yeah, I just think yeah. it's a piece of shit. Like I, I, you know, if his politics were were good here and there, then no, it, great. But yeah, like, they seem yeah, more I just sort of correct. Yes, into the he talks about. I think recently yeah. in 2022, he talked about uh, the feminization of men and the fact that oh yeah, their cowardly genes. Love to hear about somebody's sure. genes affecting their um, personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and then he yeah, read the uh, whole thing. Uh, was, yeah, he says that uh, they're cha they're swapping their genes now with a j for skirts which, yeah i can't even talk yeah. good you know uh. <laughs> um he also do you guys did you see this variety uh profile of him just a couple of weeks did ago not, mercifully uh i i'm so first of all he says something about how will smith would never have slapped chris rock if they had allowed him to have Zelensky in attendance at the oscars <laughs> oh yeah uh, is this when he reveals that he gave zelensky his academy award yeah he wanted God, them to insane. melt his oscars down and turn them into bullets but but then also um he says uh he's talking about the ai uh the the labor dispute with sag and the wga over ai and he says, quote, so you want my scans and voice data and all that? Okay, here's what I think is fair. I want your daughters because I want to create a virtual <laughs> replica <laughs> of her nice. and invite my friends over to do whatever we want in a virtual party oh my right God. now. Would you please look at the camera and tell me you think that's cool? Um, what I got a lot of questions. Happening What's a virtual stuff? party? I think is maybe the first <sighs> question that I have. But this also, guy doesn't know how to use his own fucking phone. Like I just yeah. Uh, and then I'm just imagining poor Vincent D'Onofrio reading this. Vincent D'Onofrio, of course, whose daughter uh, Layla George, his daughter with Greta Scacchi, uh, was married to Sean Penn for two years mm. while he was, let's see, Infinity, and she was like 28. Yeah. 
And so <laughs> just like realizing it's, I could have just given a hologram of my daughter to not that he gave his daughter, but you know, like it's just gross. Don't leave everyone's daughters out of your mouth. Mm. Stop talking about daughters so much. Yeah. He's disgusting. I don't like, I don't know. I got, I got no energy for this guy. Piece of shit. Yeah. Bad actor. Let's move yeah. on to Tim Robbins. Another weird man. Tim Robbins, of course, around this time, there was this incident where the Baseball Hall of Fame was going to mm. show Bull Durham. I think we've for talked its, like, about 15th this before. Yeah. Anniversary. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then they decided not to show it because Tim Robbins had spoken out against the Iraq War. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess that was a problem. Um, and uh, even Kevin Costner, famous Hollywood Republican, was in defense of Tim Robbins saying whatever he wants. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, Ron Shelton, the director of uh, the film, said, Baseball is the great American game of language and dissent. And Bull Durham is merely a story that tries to connect us. Really confused. <laughs> Can either of you speak to baseball as a game of language and dissent? No. I'm not on, I'm not on that level, I'm afraid. That tier of I guess it's like brain. yelling, what is this guy, a bum? I guess uh -huh. it's like uh -huh. <laughs> the language and dissent Yeah, part. I want a batter, not a broken yeah. ladder. That type of thing is very provocative. Yeah, yeah, we want a pitcher, not a belly itcher, of course. Yeah. Uh, but, but so he's working with these two like famous liberal guys Tim Robbins was, you know, uh, right. a big he's Ralph like, I mean, Nader guy. He's like married. He's like married to Susan Sarandon. Like yeah. they've they've got there's political continuity yep. there. Right. But now he's uh, against COVID mandates, mm. uh, like vaccine mandates. So he's he's gone. Oh really? Yeah, he's cracked a little bit. Um, I, I mean, I applaud you guys for keeping up with the, the various opinions of these old guys. <laughs> it's really, just... Yeah, this is a Sisyphean punishment we've subjected ourselves to. <laughs> old guy opinions. Yeah, yeah. we did something wrong. Um, I want to ask if the following, speaking of Tim Robbins, I want to play a clip for you guys and ask, do you guys think this is good or bad? This is from the film. You know what I was thinking about, huh? Vampire. What about them? Yeah. They're undead, but I think maybe there's something beautiful about it. Maybe one day you wake up and you forget what it's like to be human. Maybe then it's okay. What the fuck are you talking about, Dave? Exactly. Vampires, sweetie. Werewolves. So, is that good? Or is that stupid? I'm gonna blame... Lahane for that. Danny. I think that's Lahane's yeah. fault, and I think Tim Robbins did his best with yeah. some really airport novel writing there. Yeah, unfortunately, Vampires. I'm an imbecile Vampires. because I like that a lot when it happened. I because mean, it's I so think weird. I've, yeah, and I will say that it is so weird. Uh, yeah. I like the, you need Marsha Gay Harden's character there to like be an audience stand and say like, yeah, this is insane. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? But. Then it makes me feel like the film knows it's weird and uh, not to uh, about face here emotionally, but I will say that abuse is a confusing thing that is not always yeah. expressed in like totally uh, poetic or coherent language. So I'm, I'm open yep. to this and I'm also going to spoil what I think is a genuinely great film. So if somebody wants to check out Wolf House, skip ahead 15 seconds or whatever. Oh, this is the Chilean film? Right? Yeah, so this is an extremely experimental Chilean film that's like semi-stop motion uh, about a girl in this strange house that's evolving. Um, and then it turns out much later that uh, the wolf that's hunting her is a representation of this real, very strange German religious community in Chile that was like kidnapping uh, and bringing in people to this cult and sexually abusing them. Um, but it's using this like surface story frame narrative of like a, a fable, right? Like a children's uh, fantasy story, you know, about a girl being hunted by a wolf in a house in the forest. Um, and I guess it reminded me of that, which obviously this yeah. film came out 12 years later or whatever. So it's totally unrelated. But uh, I, right. I think like somebody trying to wrap their head around abuse in terms that make sense to them, even if they're totally silly and... Uh, not don't represent the weight of what you're really talking about is uh, I don't know affecting to me. I'll get on board with that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like especially for going with like what I think this movie does do well, which is like just demonstrating not only 
have a lot of these characters like endured a lot of abuse, especially the Tim Robbins character, but that they don't have the tools to process mm-hmm. it. Yeah, like, no, that, exactly. Like does contextualize it. Yeah, I don't know. This movie is really good at like contextualizing how uh, masculinity is a prison for right. men. I don't think it does a very good job of demonstrating how it affects the women in their mm-hmm. lives. I think it's just a fucking mess in that they, regard. Yeah, well, they don't they don't get any time. Like there are these little moments. Like I think Marsha Gay Harden's performance is very good. Uh, yeah. uh, the role is sometimes sometimes doesn't deserve her. But like, there's a moment when when she's at uh, Jimmy's house after the memorial service, and like everyone's gone to sleep, and they're they, they're sharing a drink together uh, before she goes home. There, she gets up to leave quickly, like sort of she she got to get out of there because she thinks that her husband has killed Emmy Rossum, and she doesn't want to mention it. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, Sean Penn has left the cabinet open where he got the, the oh, whiskey yeah. from. This is a nice touch. And she closes it like sort of semi-consciously. And I don't know if this was a character choice. I don't know if Marsha Gay Harden is just the kind of person who like if there's a cabinet open, she'll close it because she's a like a nice person. Uh, but there's like these little moments where she is just giving it her all. And I think she she does heroic work in this. Uh, despite what she's given, but then she also kind of goes into like, I mean, there's a there's a moment where the the movie just needs her to be just like a wriggling, uh, neurotic mess, much like the Michelle Williams character in in Shutter Island, mm-hmm. um, and you know she does the best I think anyone could with that, but it's it's hard I think to do that. There's that sort like of thing. enough there for her character to be like to have more to do but it just it it feels like the story abandons her at a pretty mm. critical point where it's like i i liked the like i mean because of the vampire scene we just played you know exactly why she is like wait yeah. what, like why would she trust her husband in that right. situation but then for that to come around in the way that like laura linney is like you should always trust what your husband says husbands are famously honest <laughs> and you're just like what <laughs> like there and, and so but and then she's like sort of portrayed as like this pathetic person towards the end who's like clinging to the one thing that she has left because her community has abandoned her and it's not even that i don't believe that that might be true but it's just presented like there's no it feels like the movie loses sympathy for her Mm -hmm. as as she processes what to me seems like a pretty logical line of thought right Right. Just you know, because she turns out to be she wrong. Should have brought it uh-huh. to Jimmy? Maybe not. Yeah. But it does seem like the movie punishes her pretty harshly right. for yeah. vocalizing what is a very, very logical. Well, and it's um, also yeah, occurrence. it's like it's like she's punished for not saying something sooner. But then it turns out that she's not even right. She shouldn't so it's have like, said anything. You should, yeah. But like, if you genuinely believe this, then you you have an obligation to tell somebody, even if it turns out that you're wrong and your husband gets knifed in the belly because he is so broken by his trauma that he doesn't even know what's real and what's not. Right. I mean, and it's like, there's so much interesting stuff in there. Cause it's like, they're, you know, generationally and just because of everything we've been talking about, like he, her, you know, Tim Robbins doesn't have the tools to process this trauma so that he can talk about it with her. And she probably doesn't have the tools to support him because it's just not something that is ever discussed. And it's like, that is like really interesting and horrible and sad but it's like we know we don't get to see like she just appears as the plot needs her to it, they're like because it and and the fact that the i think that like it's a cool detail that she and laura linney are cousins but it just seems like that is an offhand boston stereotype thing to do mm-hmm. like everyone's <laughs> yeah. cousins with everybody like everyone fucking, in boston has sure. cousins yeah but but like use that relationship if you're going to go out of your way to state it like that i mean seeing those two characters talk like duke it out about this or even duke it out about the way the clearly the very different ways they think about marriage which we don't know about laura lenny till the end anyways but it's like there i feel like the whole story like you wouldn't need to change very much about the story and it would have been better if those characters like you got like a moment to really as like an audience member sit with like well how do i feel you know in comparison to how these women do but again they just don't care 
to the extent that it's like an Irish mob type film, right? I think the Irish mob typical in the sense of any organized crime or semi-organized crime that comes out of working class communities, poor communities, where you have groups of people, communities that are neglected by the government, right? They're disenfranchised, they're uh, robbed of resources. And that generates, of course, people who are looking for quick ways to make money, right? The, one of the main motivations of crime, hence what, what we would like to address with a welfare state, for example. Uh, and then you also get groups of people who have to uh, create like their own DIY structure of support, right? Because they feel ignored by the police or ignored by, you know, you, you replace this lack of resources with some type of community based on intense loyalty, maybe violence. And then, of course, the reality is mm -hmm. those groups are oftentimes preying on the same community that they're, quote unquote, like right. protecting or something through extortion. Right. Yeah. Um, totally. But I think we almost always are just looking at the men who come together to respond to this. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Bechdel test, just yeah, JK, JK, come on. Um, <laughs> uh, not just to say like we're only looking at women in terms of their relation to like men's goals or, or men's actions or something, but even just to say in these communities, I think if you've had any exposure to them in fiction or in real life, women are also coming up with all sorts of healthy and unhealthy like compensatory structures, right? How are they responding? Mm -hmm. So fascinating right. to look at. Like maybe the only slight example we get of this is like the, the Harris's mom, right? Who I think has an, like a little uh, right. space to right. at least she feels like somebody who has her own opinions and and life around something. I mean, it's still related to her her husband supposedly having run out on her. But uh, yeah, I don't know, man. It just feels like if you're interested in how these people respond with their lack of tools in so many ways, show me some other mm -hmm. very interesting people who are on screen, but uh, we don't get to find out at all what they do, basically. Yeah. I, I think... A lot of the contemporary reviews of the film were talking about its examination of vigilantism, vigilantism, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. especially, you know, as directed by Dirty Harry, um, the vigilante sure. cop. And, you know, I, I think it's th there is kind of a, a ticking clock put on the cops when I almost said it like a, uh, the cop. <laughs> When uh, Sean Penn says, like, how long until you mm -hmm. find my daughter's killer? And then he immediately employs the Savage Brothers, of which one of whom is a Wahlberg, yep. uh, like a like mm -hmm. a fourth tier Wahlberg, uh, Robert. Yeah, he and works at he works at the burger joint now. Oh, Does he? nice. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, OK, I believe uh, so did I. He'd yeah, probably thank be you good at yeah. me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I figured this is sort of like, a, you know, Boston knowledge. Uh, but they, they're like. <laughs> He sends them to do sort of a parallel investigation and they go sort of Casey Affleck style, like talking to people who won't talk to the, the police. And yeah. obviously this ends up, the movie shows that this doesn't work at all because not only does he find the wrong guy, but he finds him at exactly the same time, like editing wise, that the police find the right guy. And so it's, it's like a... a firmly against the vigilantism i wonder if there's anything to be read into the film coming out in the, the immediate aftermath of the u.s invading iraq which was mm -hmm. an act of kind of uh geopolitical vigilantism that clint was semi opposed to at the time and then more vocally opposed to later when it was i think his his vocal opposition to it came as that got easier and easier to do politically, um, but uh, he also even criticized the invasion of Afghanistan, which is um, more unusual. What do they say? Based? <laughs> Am I saying that right? Based. Uh -huh. uh, but there's a. I mean, it it functions. I think as a pretty good critique of vigilantism from a guy who. Has made a lot of critiques of vigilantism, but they aren't always quite as they don't always work quite as well because the guy doing them doing the vigilantism is often uh, very cool. Clint Eastwood making himself yep. look nice yep. while he does it, you know. Right? Yeah. I don't know. Am I off base there, Ian? What do you think about that? No, I, I mean, I think the only thing I'd add to complicate it uh, to use that 
a classic word, um, is <laughs> that we have Tim Robbins' character also vigilante, uh, not in a necessarily defensible yeah. way, but just in sort of like we understand as an individual yeah. human, he's sort of not operating as like this force for justice necessarily. Just, I mean, it, it seems to me maybe a more realistic look at uh, what vigilantism really is, because I think in reality, I think both uh, the police who do it and criminals who are carrying out like loyalty, violence or whatever, uh, community justice, uh, they just have like a juvenile underdeveloped sense of what it means to to uh, respond to harm, right? They're just saying like, well, if somebody harms somebody, yeah. you got to harm somebody else to make it good again. And again, yeah. I'm including the police in that. But to include a character who is just saying, I was harmed and now I'm harming somebody else. And I, it's right. not like with a, an intention or with a, a feeling yeah. that it's going to resolve anything. It's just happening. I think that's that's also very interesting. I mean, as the famous phrase goes, Mystic River people, Mystic River people. Uh-huh. You know? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. It's true. <laughs> there's a... The, the movie does one of those things where it sort of tells you how to watch it when uh, they first sit down with Sean Penn in the, like, morgue cafeteria or wherever that is <laughs> yeah and he says um he starts talking about how you know you ever think about how one one decision changes your whole life forever and it's he is tracing all of this back to if a different one of them had gotten into the car then he wouldn't have met his first wife with whom he had the daughter and so if he never had the daughter she couldn't have been murdered and I think the movie is actually full of all of these like contingencies and all of these chains of consequence where because he did the crime and then got ratted out by Ray Harris Sr., his uh, the Emmy Rossum's mm. uh, boyfriend's dad, Just Ray. he mm. went to prison and then he killed Just Ray and that if Just Ray hadn't been killed, then the, the Harris boys might have grown up a little better the brother wouldn't have been so devastated by uh uh brendan eloping Mm -hmm. to las vegas that he wouldn't have accidentally shot emmy rossum and the gun wouldn't have accidentally ended up in their house uh shout out to eli wallach by the way apparently a one take performance i gotta be Um, honest didn't even recognize him unfortunately didn't even notice until the credits and i said oh wow of course it was it sounds like sounds like you haven't seen the holiday uh speaking of it's complicated damn shame and that's a damn (laughs) shame because that is is a barn burner of a movie in that movie Mm -hmm. it is so fun yeah he's like he's like an old hollywood writer who lives down the street from where the the house where Kate Winslet is is yeah. shacking up and they, she becomes friends like there's sort of there's this very in my opinion Jamie feel free to to argue with me but I think the romance between her and Jack Black is kind of cursed but her relationship with Eli Wallach is so lovely well, that it redeems that half of the movie. Yeah, that that movie is funny because it's I mean it just like has such like the way it feels about the bodies of its stars is laid so bare and the fact Ugh. that Jude Law and Cameron Diaz are fucking essentially the entire movie and Jack yeah. Black gets a little kiss at the end of it. Like, right. it's just like, mm. the, it, yeah, I was like, wow, it really was uh, a, a real decade for making people feel right. horrible yep. about well, their Well, Kate Winslet, bodies. too, the famously disgustingly corpulent woman of uh, if, if Hollywood executives were, were to be Very believed. Strange, but yeah. uh, Eli Wallach and that, his his whole role is like talking about how Hollywood is different now than it used to be. And it's like, you know, uh, when I first came to Hollywood, uh, your movie would make, uh, uh, $1 and now it makes a million dollars. Like that's all that he says the whole time. It's wonderful. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's nice to see him back here. Um, Mm -hmm. after all the spaghetti Westerns with Clint. Also now we're getting into the point where a lot of the, the sort of Clint guys, Clint's got an army of guys online who will argue, <laughs> especially in this later period, that his sort of his apparent artlessness is actually a very strong and brilliant artistic choice. Um. And I feel like we get a little bit of that here, <laughs> where specifically in the vampire scene, the movie, th- this is often like this is a place, this bugs me a lot in movies. Directors love to have children watching a cartoon that hasn't been on television for 80 mm-hmm. years so that they can show off 
a favorite cartoon of theirs or like something thematically right. relevant where like crazy cat with two k's is like doing something that is about to happen in whatever yeah. tarantino movie it is yep. also they love to show a horror movie that would never play on television to show how cool they are at thinking of an old horror movie but yeah. in yeah, this nice. case the movie he is watching ian did you clock this jamie did you clock this no no john carpenter's vampires oh wow with james woods Oh, so he was just saying the name of the movie. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Watching a vampire exactly. movie. I thought he was uh, just like, that's, that's great. Yeah, he knows. Yeah. Um, you know, he's he's saying, uh, uh, you know what I'm thinking about? Uh, the directed video sequel, Vampires Los Muertos. Mm -hmm. um, who's in that? We've got, oh, that's the one with John Bon Jovi, by oh, the way. Oh, wow. But um, apparently Carpenter wanted Clint Eastwood to play the James Woods role in that movie. So maybe it was a little nod. Mm. Also, James mm -hmm. Woods is in True Crime, yes. a couple Clint Eastwood movies ago. Yep. But also, this is just a movie that would have been on television. Like, mm -hmm. this is a very realistic and also a thing that a Tim Robbins type guy would watch. Like, a, Tim Robbins' character isn't going to watch some, uh, you know, now uh, acclaimed Mexican vampire movie uh -huh. that wasn't available in the States for 50 years yes. or whatever. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also want to give some quick shout outs to uh, some of our favorite characters who appear in the film. There is a tabloid in the background in one of the scenes at Jimmy Markham's Market uh, uh, in which Kim Basinger uh, appears. So shout out Kim Basinger. Also got a bus mm -hmm. ad for the 2002 film I Spy mm -hmm. starring Eddie Murphy and Owen Wilson. Yep. I caught a I caught a SpongeBob. Oh, the you end of the you movie. caught a SpongeBob. Like, that placed it in time. That was like, oh, yeah. Because this movie does feel like it takes place a little bit outside of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was also, did you catch this in the in the parade, Jamie? And mm -hmm. shout out to the the fellows over there at Podcast the Ride. There was a McGruff. There was a, a, big, a guy in a McGruff yes, suit. Who could, who could miss right. the honking McGruff they managed? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't believe they got McGruff. He's so busy. He was booked and busy in 2003. Are you it's kidding? True. Yeah. And now he's now he's just like available to uh for like PSAs for pay, where he'll say yeah, like, "Yeah, he's working uh, at Wahlburgers with the with the yeah, drivers, like, you know? Be very careful that you're buying legitimate sneakers. <laughs> there are too many duplicates <laughs> on the market. Yeah, it's like that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I think this movie takes place in a in a much more real world than many other films of this of its ilk, and I I do appreciate that. Although I don't know oh. how much that is Clint making a choice or Clint saying. Uh, we don't need to set dress uh, any of this. Just have what whatever is in the. Is there a parade going on? Let's film during Almost it. You know, certainly the latter, yeah. but that's okay. I would, yeah, yep. I would guess. It. <laughs> Although I would love if if I could, you know, give Clint an assignment. I would love to see his take on McGruff. Uh, oh, I think yeah. he could really, you know, yeah. bring back McGruff, and that Absolutely. would be a safe place to, mm. to put. Him. Although now we're in old man Clint period, so we're going to get an old man yeah. McGruff uh, still involved yeah. in threesomes. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> McGruff looking back on his life, yeah. <laughs> his fourteen years of uh -huh, life, exactly. yeah. and uh, <laughs> having some real regrets. Uh, wish I took a wife out of crime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, speaking of. Clint Eastwood and Dogs. Jamie, have you seen Sudden Impact, the third, no. so the fourth Dirty Harry movie? Okay. Uh, no. He's got a dog in it. The dog okay. is, what's the dog's name? Meat, meatball? Meatball sounds Something right. Like He's a bulldog. It's a big bulldog yeah. that is sometimes okay. play, played by a very visibly testicles having bulldog yeah. and sometimes played by a very visibly recently a uh, nursing bulldog like it's just a <laughs> oh we talked yeah. about this it's very like he's just like it's like tiresias mm, like he's or such a mess okay. is he just blowing yeah. up that gender binary that we all hate no i think he's <laughs> actually i think that that's one where i'm willing to say this is a, <laughs> a too, distinct choice by clint but jamie i gotta play this for you uh okay. and i i i hope this is okay that you've you've i think you at this point have just opened yourself up to all manner of ephemera like this this is a scene from the very opening of sudden impact where uh dirty harry has come on come upon this disgusting crime scene and his partner guy while well, he's eating a certain handheld food oh, item I, I, that is like the one thing i know about this mm. yeah. okay yeah so i'm gonna play this and he asked he's just asked dirty harry what if something's bothering him no this stuff isn't getting to me the shootings the knifings the beatings 
old ladies being bashed in the head for their social security checks, teachers being thrown out of a fourth floor window because they don't give A's. That doesn't bother me a bit. Come on, Harry, take it easy. Or this job either, having to wade through the scum of this city, being swept away by bigger and bigger waves of corruption, apathy, and red tape. No, that doesn't bother me. But you know what does bother me? What? You know what makes me really sick to my stomach? I know what? what? Say. It's watching you stuff your face with those hot dogs. Nobody, I mean nobody, puts ketchup on a hot dog. Yeah, one of the most offensive things Clint has ever put. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Put on screen, just a real. I don't know, like is like where is where is he from? Is he from, he's from the Bay he's Area? From yeah. he's San Francisco. From, he's from Piedmont, yeah, which is like a, a white enclave within Oakland. Yeah. Well, clearly he wants to impress people from Chicago mm-hmm. or something. I don't know yeah. why he's talking shit like that. You know, I mean, and and I get talking about hot dogs. Yeah. Great. My favorite. <laughs> my favorite. Mm-hmm. Of course. Uh, but, you know, bringing that kind of negativity into the conversation for what? You're a famous hot like dog it. liberationist, right? You really think that people should live their lives. It's very true. It's very well, true. It's interesting because Clint, Clint is such a libertarian and mm-hmm. you would think... Sure. As a libertarian, he would stay out of prescribing what can and can't go on a hot dog. But well, like most yeah. libertarians, he is inconsistent fickle, and a liar. Fickle, fickle. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Um. Oh, but also he, uh, uh, Harry, of course, is eating a hot dog with a an unusual two hand method, mm. sort of like a flute. Uh, mm. just prior to the famous. A bank robbery sequence in the first Dirty Harry movie where he does gives the the do you feel lucky speech. So mm-hmm. Harry's a hot dog guy, I think, just because he's he's got no time for sitting down for for uh you know linen napkins and and forks and knives. He's got to eat quick because mm-hmm. crime doesn't rest. So you know why should he? Yeah. Well, any stray thoughts? Do we have any any observations we didn't get to? Oh man, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I mean, this is, uh, this movie is just, it's, it's a lot. I feel like we, we didn't really talk as much about the, like, the Harris family. Mm, but I honestly, didn't. once it got to, like, the, I couldn't even tell really, like, how, if there was, a, like, something that was, like, left on the table there. Because at that point, you're meeting, like, your seventh brutally traumatized male character. And I yeah. think I was just, like, tired by the time we got around to what was going on with the Harris family. Because you're already so consumed with yeah. what's going on with everybody else. That I'm like, maybe that was well executed. Maybe it wasn't. But I felt like I was so emotionally exhausted by the time we got there that I genuinely have no idea. Yeah, I, I think Clint's movies at their best get at a certain bottomless chain of brutalities like a a a kind of um endless series of cruelties that have brought any american to where they are in this exact moment so many of his movies from the westerns to the uh the the cop films which often invoke the wild west and and Mm -hmm. you know the colonization they get at this the fact that there's everywhere you scratch the surface there's killing and brutality and obviously this being set in Boston uh and and named for a river that was very like casually uh misnamed by uh English speakers assuming that the Massachusetts word they were hearing was just a word they already knew i mean there's there's mm-hmm. i guess a a way you could read this as being about the i don't know the 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 original sin at the center of American life or something. I don't think it's really <laughs> there as much as it's just always a thematic concern. Um, yeah. And I do have to justify having this podcast mm, still. Uh, I understand but, that. Uh, there's something there. I don't know. Ian, were you going to say something smarter than that? Mm, well, I wouldn't Dare say that. You. I was going to say something though. Thank you. I, well, now I'm going to say two things. First of all, when a bunch of Irish guys go somewhere, that's a special type of colonization now, isn't it? Um, and the second thing That's that I so want to good, say. dude. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, shout out to uh, by the way, shout out to Connor O'Malley's uh, video about the Irish mob. If anyone hasn't seen that, uh, where he says I'd give up classic, every computer yeah. in the world to bring back the Irish mob. Yes, um, uh, so check beautiful. It out. It's probably better than this movie. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say is. We get a moment here that's like walking the line and I don't know if there's any takeaway about it, but... That's the same year as this movie. Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, Sorry. 
where Kevin Bacon says, I'm going to send him home the place he's been going his whole life talking about uh, one of these products that you're saying, Jamie, of these extremely broken homes in broken neighborhoods, uh, sending them to prison, right? As part of this like intergenerational cycle of crime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, is that the borderline eugenics uh, essentialized in a bad way version of like there are just people who are born criminals um, and yeah Irish can, people uh, uh, yes or is that the type of essentialization that sometimes happens when we're trying to address real problems like having to say okay based on the environment that they grew up in it's so common that that's the way, which means we have to change the environment. I don't know which of those two versions it is. Is it just like the dismissive version that allows us to say a uh, favorite phrase on here? We have like ontological criminals who we just write off as bad people. Or is this mm -hmm. like a critique of the, you know, products of their environment, meaning we have to, to make social change? I'm not sure. But mm. uh, like you're saying, it seems to fit into this like wearisome and wearied approach to looking at all these different people and they all seem to be various forms of damage which which i think is like interesting because theoretically like lahane is coming from like pretty close to that lived experience mm -hmm. and so the fact that that is the way that it comes off it's like i don't even know how intentional is it is he like you know romanticizing his own shit like it, it's kind of un i don't know enough about him to really make a call of like what his goal is there yeah i mean he seems to have been like a born writer or like a writer from as f as far back as he can remember so i think it, it may be with lahane especially it seems like despite being a guy who left Boston and lives in Southern California now uh, is just obsessed with the fact that every, everywhere you look in Boston is misery and pain. Yeah, seems like kind of a him thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seems like, you have to start yeah, that. Yeah, like, I think he yeah. defines the, uh, the global view of the mm -hmm. city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's a way that... So Clint gives a lot of the, the kind of ontological criminal stuff he gives that to Fishburne, which I think is interesting that we have one of the... Yeah. Is he the only black character in the film? Basically, the only black character in the film yeah. saying... The captain is also black, I believe. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's saying, like, he asks Sean Penn about how he did some time a while back in a way that suggests that this is, you know, a, a an uncleanable stain mm -hmm. on his character. He also talks about how... He can tell that the guy he's been in prison because he carries it in his chest or whatever, or instead of in his shoulders or something like that. Some kind of like very bodily, like Mark physical of Cain type thing. Permanent, uh -huh. yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's you know, Clint. It's often the, the incoherence we're, we've been talking about. There's a question always of is he just being post racial and trying to say that you know, uh, black cops can also be like everyone can be racist or something or is he saying that the white supremacy at the root of uh law enforcement can infect us all mm -hmm. who knows mm -hmm. um by the way uh wearisome and wearied might be a good future name for this podcast <laughs> um, yeah. and also i'm sorry that i interrupted you it was uh 2005 when walk the line came out i just like needed so bad to sure. hear my own voice it's okay. i guess it's okay <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. My last, my last observations are just two, two good names. Mm. Character named Eve Pigeon. Yeah. That rocks. Yeah. 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 yeah, uh, yeah. I wish, I wish we had uh, heard that name more. <laughs> Real good. And then there was a an acting professor at my college who was in this. I didn't. I oh, didn't shit. major in acting, but a guy named Ken Cheeseman. I always remember. Oh yeah, his I name saw Ken Cheeseman's name. Yeah. Due to it being Ken Cheeseman, <laughs> and uh, apparently he taught at my school. Understandable. The end. Oh, he's the guy. Shut he's up, the Ken. guy drinking with Dave in the bar. Apparently, when they see Emmy yeah. Rossum dancing. Oh shit! Iconic okay. character, uh -huh. Dave's friend in bar. I mean, he's got some, classic. He's Cheeseman. got some lines, right? Does he say something about yeah? The oh yeah. Red yeah. Sox losing. Oh, uh, Eve Eve Pigeon is played by Ari Grainer uh from a bunch of stuff where you're like oh i've seen that person before she's from boston and she she was the friend in nick and nora's infinite playlist mm, yeah 
Um, sure. Oh, sure. she's Meadow's so. roommate in, in The Sopranos. Oh, oh shit. Okay. Nice. Um, is that okay. from the episode with Perez Hilton in it? I, as a woman, I cannot recall every episode okay. of The Sopranos off the top of my head. Sorry. I'm sorry that yeah. I, I asked you to. <laughs> um, I'd like to publicly apologize to everyone listening to the show. Um, <laughs> well. Well, I would. I have to wrap up something you st- you set up earlier in the episode, which is, of course. Oh yeah. We talk about art and politics on this podcast. And, and Boston. Um, well, first of all, you're mistaken. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, considering my own journey into becoming a politically active person who is also invested in art, all types of art, mm-hmm. uh, I believe what you were referencing earlier is, of course. My first ever, in the moment, truly anxiety-causing standing up against a massive institution, which is uh, yeah. naturally when I... Ian's first act of political engagement, right, let's say. Defiance, uh, trying to change the world around me. When I printed out a form letter from online in order to f- the phone the NBC... Uh, corporation and tell them that they must not cancel the Black Donnellys. They simply cannot <laughs> be canceling the Black Donnellys. Brave. Um, very, very brave. Thank you. Yeah. So much. I was Huge. 14 I, years old. Uh, yeah. Just to be clear. Ian, Ian was texting me about this and he said that when he looked, he figured out when this happened, he was praying that he had been 13 and was deeply ashamed to find out that he had been 14. I don't know. It seems like, like first of all, every, I don't know what these distinctions are. Every year that gets... There, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think I so. It. Every year that gets tacked on yeah. feels like, oof, pretty close to just the person <laughs> well, I am now, I think it which is not what is I want to hear. That's beautiful. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah. And also, you know, future Richard Jewell star, Olivia Wilde, was at the time it was certainly think, a, driving a many, of it. many yeah. straight 14 year old boys to to uh <laughs> madness uh-huh. and All look at the of... time she was engaging you politically and now you know maybe something maybe she's up to some other stuff but we don't mm-hmm. have to talk about that yes. yeah we'll get to that um, the, and to be clear the black Dollar of, of course takes place in new york's hell's kitchen neighborhood so mm-hmm. oh shit boston Damn how it. dare you unbelievable mm-hmm. well I'm sorry to I'm sorry to everybody. I'm sorry to all those Donnellys over there. <laughs> With that, thank you, Jamie Loftus, so much oh, for joining thank us. Thank you on so the much podcast for having me. Thank you, you know, Jamie. I love to talk about somebody's daughter, especially when I <laughs> yeah. know nothing about the daughter and she was just killed so the movie could stay. <laughs> yeah. She loved to dance on the table. She loved she to do a sort happy. of an impromptu like, coyote ugly. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. she looked happy. Yeah, she looked Never happy. Mind the I read fact this that she wasn't it. old enough uh, to get into the fucking bar. <laughs> yeah i mean it was called a breakout role which really seemed like more of a comment about how women in hollywood are appraised yeah. than uh because she basically yeah. does not act in the film she's barely on no, screen so to say like 70 this was dead. wonderful wonderful role uh for emmy ross what an opportunity uh, okay. look she does pop yeah she does pop. She's, I, I like her yeah i was thinking also there's two tim robbins starring a Boston-based films from around this time. You got this. You got Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. This one has Emmy Rossum. Mm-hmm. War of the Worlds has Justin Chatwin. And then, of course, the two of them are in the film Dragon Ball Evolution wow. in 2009. It of course. So, of course. It all <laughs> comes yeah. together. Where can people find more of what you're working on right now, Jamie? More of your work? Besides, of course, the, the wonderful book Raw Dog. The Naked Truth About Hot Dogs, available wherever books are sold. Uh, And also, I've got one in my hands, just to (laughs) brag. Yeah, you can also check out the uh, cool workbook that there is available on Amazon that Ian found. (laughs) Um, No, I I, I am uh, writing on Star Trek Lower Decks right now, so you can watch that on Paramount+. Mm, Plus. Um, I got to be honest, that scared me. I was like, I, I, I had come to terms with like all right so somebody who wrote a real book gonna be on the show but i can handle that and then i found out you also wrote a fucking star trek and i'm like how am i supposed to, to supposed to act you normal around this person you yeah. hate to see it yep but you love to see that show so uh mm-hmm. there you check go check the show out check the show out and uh, you're on social media yeah, and stuff at yeah, all the I'm on uh, that instagram uh at jamie christ superstar and uh still on twitter you know for the time being at Jamie Loftus mm. Health. People are always like, I'm there for now. I'm like, I'll probably be there until I die. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's going to yeah, take yeah, something yeah. pretty bad uh, at this point. 
Um, so I, I'm still over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's gonna it's gonna take some more pretty yeah. bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and speaking of uh, all those bad websites, um, we are on Twitter and Instagram at Podcasty for me. Uh, remember to subscribe, rate us, write a review, helps us on the algorithm. If you like the show, tell a friend, tell your dad, uh, write most of the show, name of the show in some wet concrete. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Clint Eastwood podcast, you can email us at podcastyforme at gmail.com. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. Next week, we are talking about the movie The One Million Dollar Baby, uh, where Clint actually wins the Oscars again. Uh, famous film. Haven't seen it. Looking forward to finding out if it's good or bad. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a short episode. We're just going to say whether it's good or bad. <laughs> if you want to watch that movie, it is available to stream here in the United States on all the usual places. Ian, down there in Mexico, what do you got? Million Dollar Baby. It is available also streaming with a subscription on Max and Google Play and unfortunately amazon and that's it but i guess we could imagine one place that it might stream in the future is apple TV. no okay and all right just trying to help you you know what we can't imagine it because the the ai bill burr doesn't sound like anything <laughs> okay. so right. i was trying to find like they don't have mark Wahlberg. they don't mm-hmm. have matt damon they don't have, ben, they don't have like any boston people they don't even have it's not, ted it's not, wow. an, it's not yeah. an accident it's uh it's an accent no yeah. one can do famously <laughs> uh well this has been a delight thanks jamie yes. for being uh, here thanks, for thanks ian for being here And uh, thanks everybody for listening to the show, and we will see you later.